Welcome back. In this episode of Oxygen Not Included, I'm going to be taking a look here at natural gas geysers and trying to set up a very efficient power plant around them. Now this video was inspired by several comments I've read from you guys talking about natural gas geysers. Um, Bowler here was talking about the entire process of this and trying to look at all the dynamics of it, right? So you got the natural gas geyser, it produces the gas, the ga a pump moves the gas into the generators, the generators consume it, and then it gives off a bunch of byproducts and dealing with those byproducts in an efficient way. There is also other comments here like Bubba Attacks comment that says, uh, please make a video on natural gas geysers because you've been afraid to get to tap into those yet because they can be kind of a rare thing and there's not, you know, if you don't necessarily understand all the equipment that goes into them, you might be a little bit timid to actually start using them, but they're absolutely awesome. And if you are lucky enough to run across one of them in the game, then you should definitely make the most out of them. So for example, just to kind of give you an, an idea here, this is a new map that I just spawned into because I was using this as test lab number two here. And look at how much I've had to dig out before I found one natural gas geyser. And the closest one to my printing pod was way over here. And I mean, you can see the temperatures on this thing. Look at that, over 100 degrees Celsius in this area. <laughs> it's kind of intimidating to get into it. So there's a lot of dynamics that goes on here to make this stable and kind of hands-free. And from a more scientific standpoint here, we're going to take a look at just how efficient it is to tap into one of these gas geysers because it does take equipment in order to make the most out of a gas geyser. So what's the cost of running all the pumps and what's the yield of all the natural gas we're getting out of it? So we'll be doing a little bit of calculating. So a prime example of that is this little setup right here. Very simple, right? You got a natural gas geyser, I got a bunch of batteries. I've got three natural gas generators over here. Now real quickly, if we take a look at the natural gas geyser, it's emitting natural gas at 121.6 grams a second. Looking at the requirements for the gas generator, we'll see that it consumes 60 grams a second of natural gas. So it's very easy to understand that that one geyser cannot support three natural gas generators. However, is it more or less efficient to have the three generators as compared to two? And how does that change the results? We'll see that. We can also see that its byproducts are 67.5 grams a second of polluted water, 82.5 grams a second of carbon dioxide, and gives us a nice yield of 800 watts, but it also produces 20 watts of heat. And in this setup, one thing to really keep in mind here is the overheat temperature at 75 degrees Celsius if you're using copper ore. So in this case, because of the heat that is coming out of that gas geyser, I'm going to want to use gold amalgam here, which increases the overheat temperature by 50 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, all my equipment here would be destroyed. <laughs> so that wouldn't be good, but we'll look further into the temperatures a little bit later. So what I have set up here is a very simple setup for one of these natural gas geysers. The gas is emitted from the geyser, fills this chamber right here, and then I have an atmospheric switch that eventually reaches one kilogram right there, and then the pump turns on. That pump now moves natural gas into one of three natural gas generators. So you can see it working right here. It moves on over, starts to fill things up, and then it produces carbon dioxide, polluted water, and 800 watts of electricity. So the carbon dioxide byproduct emits over here into the right chamber, and then I'm using an air scrubber to get rid of that carbon dioxide. Again, hooked up to an atmospheric switch. If we look at the requirements for an air scrubber right here, we'll see that it uses one kilogram a second of water to reduce 300 grams a second of carbon dioxide. That comes at a cost of 120 watts, and it gives off a byproduct of one kilogram of polluted water plus five watts of heat. Now in this natural gas geyser right here, our two byproducts are electricity, quite a lot of it, and polluted water. Now there's a couple things we could do with this polluted water. We can purify it back into water by either steam generation, which I don't necessarily have a great method to use besides lava, but if you have some recommendations, I'd love to hear it. Or you can use a water purifier, which requires a filtration medium, which is sand. So it actually takes sand to get it back to water. However, you can use polluted water in two different ways. You can make fertilizer out of it, so you can have a byproduct of fertilizer and electricity, or you can use it as irrigation. 
The two plants that use polluted water is mealwood and the pincher peppers. And if you look at the pincher peppers down here, we'll notice that the ideal temperature is 55 to 60 degrees Celsius. And if we look at the polluted water, we'll notice that its temperature is already up here at 40 degrees Celsius. So in this case, it doesn't have to become much hotter in order to become the ideal temperature range for the pincher peppers which means you're gonna get an excellent yield out of that pincher peppers. Because irrigating a farm has a dramatic effect on its temperature. So if you can bring it in at the correct temperature, that farm is gonna really be able to maintain its temperature much, much easier than trying to affect it with the gas that's surrounding it. So to me, the best byproducts you can get out of a gas geyser here is a bunch of electricity and nice, hot, polluted water. All right, so let's set one of these up from scratch and just to see what we're gonna get out of it. Ah, I nearly broke the game again. It's become so touchy lately. Okay, so let's set one of these up. Found a natural gas geyser. I'm going to go ahead and surround it. In this case, I'm gonna use Abyssalite insulated tiles. Now you can actually build pumps directly over this gas geyser. You don't necessarily need to, you know, have more space, but I will for the sake of it. I'm also gonna use an Atmo switch. Again, made of gold amalgam, because I'm gonna need that temperature resistance. Now the reason for this atmospheric switch is because this geyser doesn't necessarily always emit natural gas. It will turn on and off. And you don't want this pump to constantly run with a very, very small amount of gas inside of this chamber, because that won't be very efficient. So now that we have something surrounding the gas geyser, we're going to need all the supporting equipment. There's two very important things that we need to have connected to this pump, and one of them is a battery. The reason you need that battery is because you don't wanna have this pump without any power. This thing needs to be able to self-start, just like your car in the morning. Now the next thing you need is a power transformer. Now the reason you wanna have a power transformer here is because you want to isolate this battery from the rest of all the circuits that you have, because you don't want one of those circuits to pull all the power out of your grid and then not be able to run your pump. So that's how you isolate that circuit. Now I'll take the small side here and I'll just plug in the battery, run it to the switch, and then back to the pump, just like that, boom. And that's all that's gonna be plugged in there. After that, you're going to have your gas generators. Now in this case, you're gonna to wanna to use heavy watt wires, and I'm gonna make it out of gold amalgam. Everything's gonna be made out of gold amalgam just to protect it from overheating. So you wanna make sure you're selecting that. Now I'm gonna experiment here just a little bit by trying to stack some of this stuff. We'll see what we get here. I'm doing my own little experimentation. Some of this stuff's prepared, but there we go. We'll see if we need three. So something like that. Again, I don't necessarily know if we need three or not, but we'll figure that out in a minute. All of this is connected to each other via the heavy watt wire. And then I'm going to isolate this with the abyssalite insulated tile. So I think here, just for the sake of symmetry, I'm going to go ahead and do this number. There we go. Nice and even all the way across. And you know what? I'm also gonna change this wall a little bit. I'll do number just like that and bring it out over here. My goal is to bring the heavy watt wire out the bottom and then create a liquid lock so that the hot gas doesn't get out of this chamber. And yet we can still use the heavy watt wire elsewhere in the base if we want to. Also, somewhere over here, I'm going to want to contain all the carbon dioxide that I'm gonna be kicking out. So that's what that chamber's about. I'll throw a little air scrubber in there. Again, gold amalgam. And then an atmospheric switch. Same material. And then I'm gonna build a chamber for the liquid down here. There we go. Just like so. Okay, so in this setup right here, I've noticed that I got a gas geyser way, way up top. And it's dripping down blobs of water. So I'm actually capturing that down here. And that's what I'll use for my water source. Obviously, you can get clean water from all sorts of places or you can pump it over but I don't want to add that variable into this experiment. But I do like the idea of, of using something like that, so that's what I've done. Source of clean water, a liquid tepidizer to increase the temperature, and a pump. Last thing I need is a thermal switch, again, gold amalgam right here, and that's gonna be right next to the tepidizer. Now for the gas system. I have a ton of natural gas over here, and then I have some nasty stuff up top. So I got polluted oxygen, maybe a little bit of oxygen, maybe some other gases, and I wanna get rid of all of that. And I wanna do that before I start pumping gas out of here into the natural gas generators, because those natural gas generators will be damaged if you pump the wrong gas to them. 
So the easiest method I know of is to let some pressure build up inside of here. We'll get this to five kilograms. You don't necessarily need to get it that high, but it already is in this case. And then you can deconstruct one of these tiles around it and watch what happens. It'll flush out all of that polluted oxygen, in this case oxygen, all the stuff that's lighter, and that'll be forced out of here. So once I start to see some of this natural gas come out, then I should be good to go. Because you can see the area over here, you know, that's 500 grams, and it should be lower because this thing, this gas geyser can go up to five kilograms. So I'll just let this run for a little bit. Maybe I can knock out two tiles. That'll make it a little bit quicker. Yeah, look at that. I just want this to go until the polluted oxygen is no more. And it looks like it's struggling to get rid of some of it there. So maybe that isn't the best method, but I gave it a shot. What if I just let it vent on top? How about that? There you go. Break the roof off and then let that stuff out. That's the way to do it. Perfect. So now all I have here is natural gas. And then a little bit of water at the bottom, but that's no big deal. Now, as far as the gas pipe you're going to want to use, any of these that have plus 15 degrees Celsius right there. Give them a little bit more resistance to temperature. Now, as far as dealing with the carbon dioxide out of these gas generators, there's a couple of different things you can do. If you use a gas vent and you submerge it with a little bit of liquid, so like right down here, you see how I have a little bit of liquid down there? This can actually continuously run despite the pressure of the chamber. So you can keep pumping more and more of that carbon dioxide and just have a, a chamber that's nearly infinitely full of gas. So it'll just keep climbing and climbing and you won't have to use an air scrubber. However, that's a bit of an exploit and it's not going to last forever. I'm sure at some point they'll eventually patch that. So I'm gonna use the more conventional setup right here, which is using an air scrubber. Now, as far as the liquid pipes are concerned, I'm going to pipe this in from wherever my clean water source is, right down here to the air scrubber just like so. And one thing I want to try to do here is I'm going to use the outlet of this air scrubber to liquid cool my gas generators. Now they already have a very high temperature that they're going to overheat at, but I want to try this out just to see if it works. So I made a slight mistake in my setup here, so I'm actually going to deconstruct some of these tiles. Just create a little bump out. So just like this. How about that? and then I'll use a liquid vent right here. So the discharge from this air scrubber is going to drip down here, and then that's gonna go past this natural gas generator, which will also be dripping out its own sort of polluted water. And then it should flow over here to the left and then drop down and flow back to the right. So it'll go past all the electronics right here, hopefully not flood them, and then start filling up this chamber down here at the bottom. That's the idea, we'll see if it works. As far as the liquid lock, this is kind of the setup I have right here. So we got the heavy watt wire, it's going through the path. As the polluted water pools up right down here, it'll start to fill up this chamber. And then that's going to isolate the atmosphere out here, as far as the gas and the temperatures and stuff, from the atmosphere inside of all of this equipment. Because this is going to be putting off a lot of heat. And I don't want to heat up a bunch of gas over here by having a giant hole in the wall where this you know, heavy watt wires coming through. So for the sake of it, I'm gonna put a little bit of a power transformer right here. Bring that heavy watt wire on over. Now I can use different materials as well. And I'll also just wanna put a couple of mainline batteries here. So a mainline battery will be able to support anything that runs off of these generators. So before we get to a power transformer, we kind of isolate the power circuits, right? So everything that's after the small side is on its own circuit and can't be you know drawn back through the transformer however the mainline battery can be drawn anywhere out there so we want to make sure we have a bit of capacity that's going to build up um, from these generators because these generators are going to be running and then not running throughout the day so we want to make sure that we have some batteries that we can store this energy in and since there's a lot of energy we might want to have more batteries than just what you're seeing here now the rest of this equipment is not critical, right? So there will be liquid that builds up in this pipe. So if it runs out of power, no big deal. Again, this air scrubber has a large buffer as far as the amount of gas that can build up in this chamber. So if it doesn't have any power and can't run for a little while, no big deal. The rest of these generators will still be able to run. The same goes for pumping liquid out and all that good stuff. Now the last thing we need here is a manual generator. In order to get some power, to kick off this system because nothing runs until this gas pump 
pump some gas into this generator. So we need a little bit of power in order to get that running. Let me just get a duplicate and we'll get this thing started up. There you go, Mima. All right, so one important thing I'm seeing right here is that the, <laughs> the gas pipes are not set up right. Had a little mistake there. It's been corrected though. As far as the whole liquid and stuff like that, uh, well, it does seem to be finding its way down to the bottom. I'm not sure what's going on here, but it seems to be working. All right, so the system here is running on the left. I'm going to run kind of my uh, hydrogen bubbler test on this experiment just to get a, kind of an idea of just how much energy we're using each and every day. So I'll run for like five cycles and then average it out. The first experiment I'm going to do is with the atmospheric switches working, and then I'm going to take those away and see how much of a difference that makes. Okay, one thing I noticed is that this chamber over here that has all the carbon dioxide in it, it's probably worthwhile clearing this out. So I'm going to use that same sort of trick I did last time, where I just remove a couple of tiles and let that stuff vent. All right, so I'm starting my experiment right now here on cycle 47, and we'll see what sort of results we get. Looking at the daily reports, we can see the usage, and this number right here is the amount of power we created that day. So 935.5. Of that, we removed 79.5. All right, so here's a good example. We've kind of run out of gas, so this thing turned off for a while, but now the generators are running again. So it's not gonna be constant. There's gonna be high days and low days. Hmm, so <laughs> for whatever reason, enough liquid built up here to actually damage this pressure-wise, causing this wall to fail. So I'm actually going to move that liquid vent over here to the left a little bit. And then change this tile to a mesh tile. Just so I get flow going both ways. Don't ask me how that's possible, but that's what happened. Alright, so here's the results of the first experiment. We can see here just how many kilojoules of energy was created. The average number was 821 kilojoules a day. What that averages out to in wattage is 1,369 watts. The average amount of kilojoules that was used in order to run this system to the point of having byproduct of this many watts and some polluted water was 68.6, .6, or an average wattage of 114.4 watts. Okay, so these next two columns right here are the net results. Essentially, it is what is been created minus what is used so this is what is available to distribute throughout the rest of your colony so I have a bit of a discrepancy between just using created minus used and then what is wasted right so if we look at the reports here you'll see that wasted is the amount of power that was not able to store and we're not running anything else off of these batteries so I'm not 100% sure where the, the, the discrepancy is but we can see that there's a slight discrepancy here so the net Per my calculation, 752 kilojoules, or as far as the game is concerned, 748, or the average wattage is about 1,250 watts. So that's the result as far as the amount of energy we're creating right there. So my next experiment here, before we get into calculating how much polluted water we have, is going to be running this third natural gas generator to see if it's going to create more energy or not there is a chance that it might create more. So let's go ahead and see how that works. So this will start the next experiment on cycle 57. We can see the temperatures here are quite high as far as everything that's running through this. If we take a look at the polluted water that's leaving, it's still leaving at 40 degrees Celsius. So that's not too bad. Let's keep in mind though that this equipment here is 54 degrees Celsius right there. The one that's underneath the liquid vent though is 43 degrees 43 degrees Celsius. So you can see that this liquid vent is actually cooling this gas generator. So the liquid cooling is a real thing. I've actually experimented with it, so I'm glad to see that that is actually working. Okay, so who's ready for some really interesting and slightly confusing results? <laughs> Alright, so this system running three generators over here, by all of the numbers that I was able to capture, the amount that is being created, it is slightly less than just two generators right there. So down from 821 kilojoules to 789. We're also using slightly less to run the systems as well. Using my calculations of created minus used, you can see that it's down from 752 to 723. Now here's where things get really weird and interesting. 
the amount wasted, which mind you, as far as these reports here, wasted says your colony created X amount of energy uh, of power today and it was not used or stored in a battery. So apparently that's the amount of energy you could be using, but you're not. And get this, the discrepancy between these is quite a bit. So much so that the amount wasted is more than the amount created. So according to the game, we're actually wasting more energy than we're creating. How that's possible, I don't know, but I'm, I think I'm exposing yet another potential patch. <laughs> uh, at this point, we have to add another natural gas generator to see if that number goes up even more. Because if it does, then <laughs> who knows? Who knows what goes on from here? All right, so just out of curiosity, let's see what happens. I'll find a way to plug this in. It's not gonna be quite as clean as everything else, but you gotta do what you gotta do. This is for science. All right, starting at, get this, cycle 67. I'm not planning this out, but it's happening every 10 cycles. <laughs> we'll see what four generators does. It doesn't make any sense that this would work, but maybe, according to video game logic, it will. Maybe more is more. All right, so here's the results. And all I gotta say is at least they're consistent, right? So skipping over all the blah here, uh, we created a little bit more power per day, but still less than just two generators right there. It might just have to do with how much that natural gas geyser is running. However, the amount wasted has gone up yet again. <laughs> so, uh, according to that calculation, more is more, even though it isn't necessarily more. Think about that. Clearly, this is going to need some more experimenting. However, what I want to leave us off here today, because I am running out of time, is I want to go ahead and calculate just how much polluted water is coming out of this system. All right, so if I take the total amount of kilojoules right here, multiply by 1,000, that'll give me the amount of joules I have. Now, because a watt is one joule per second, 800 watts is equivalent to 800 joules. So for every 800 joules, I create 67.5 grams of polluted water, or 82.5 grams of carbon dioxide. So dividing the joules by the amount of grams, that gives me 11.9 joules per gram of polluted water, or 9.7 joules per gram of carbon dioxide. So if I take the total amount of joules I have in a single day, created by one of these units, and divide it by that factor right there, I now have the amount of grams. Now because that's a big number and it's hard to understand, let's go ahead and divide that by 1,000. So that gives me 69.3 kilograms of polluted water. That's coming out of the generator. I'm also generating 84.7 kilograms of carbon dioxide. Looking at the air scrubber, for every 0.3 kilograms of carbon dioxide, I'm going to create another kilogram of polluted water. So if I take the amount of carbon dioxide I've created and divide it by 0.3, that gives me another 282 kilograms of polluted water. That gives me a net result of 351 kilograms of polluted water. So if we take a look at the plants here, we'll see that the pinch of pepper consumes 30 kilograms of polluted water a day. So just out of curiosity, if we take that number and we divide it by 30, you can see it's enough for 11.7 pinch of peppers. Now mind you, the amount of power that's being used here doesn't include heating up the liquid to the right temperature or the pump that runs to the farm. So that'll have to be an experiment for another time because I'm simply out of time tonight. So what we'll see if we move this number around, 351, 338, 339, so still about the same. Now mind you, that's based off of a calculation of what's being created, which makes sense because in order to create energy, you have to run that machine, so that, that calculation should be correct, but it's, as we've seen already, there is some discrepancy that's involved in this power generation. All right, well, there we have the results. And I got to admit, this was a little bit more interesting than I thought it was going to be. I thought the natural gas geyser power plant system was going to be real boring and everything was going to be nice and straightforward. But we exposed something that might be a bug in the game. And uh, we might be able to use it to our advantage for a little while. It's also opened up many different opportunities as far as what sort of 
you know, what are the byproducts you really want out of a natural gas geyser? Because you can do different things with it. Like maybe there's a really efficient way to turn this stuff into steam. I don't know. If you guys got a good idea for creating steam, that'd be an awesome to have that down there in the description below. Because it would be sweet to be able to turn this polluted water into clean water. Or maybe you use it to cool off some of the water that's coming out of a steam geyser. I don't know. There's many different ideas. So I definitely think it's worth visiting this experiment again to see what sort of crazy ideas we can come up with. As always, thanks for watching guys and thank you guys for all of your support recently. It's been absolutely awesome. If you found this video somewhat informative or helpful or just enjoyable, let me know down there in the comment section below. And if I've earned your subscription, then thank you so much for that. Hopefully I'll see you again next time. Stay awesome guys. Peace. Brothgar out.